Have you given up on painting in oils because of the noxious fumes and odors that come along with the solvents? Or have you always wanted to try and paint in oils but you've been afraid to because of dealing with those hazardous chemicals? Well, I know how you feel. I had to quit painting in oils over 20 years ago because my son Cameron had asthma and the fumes from the paint thinners that we needed to clean our brushes really aggravated his breathing. Well, what if I told you you don't have to deal with these noxious fumes and chemicals to paint in oils? In fact, these are the paints that I'm using here right now. These are water-soluble oils. Now, I've been using these for over 20 years. And if you've ever seen a painting of mine, it was done in water-soluble oils. I think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I'm still amazed, not only that more artists aren't using them, but that so many artists haven't even heard of them yet. They've been around for over 20 years. I think one of the reasons that these aren't widely used is there's still not a lot of available instruction on how to use them. These are very different than traditional oils and we can't use the same sort of processes and techniques with traditional oils because that requires turpentine or some sort of paint thinner. Now, while these oils are water soluble, they're not water soluble in the same way as acrylics or watercolor. That's to say we don't actually dilute the paint with water to paint, but what's really important is we can just use water or soap and water to clean our brushes. Now, if you want to come a little forward here, Cameron, I have yellow paint in this brush and I'm going to show you how I clean my brush here. So I have a jug with just a little bit of warm soapy water. I'm going to rinse out the brush. I'll then rinse it in clear water. And you can see the brush is totally clean now. Now any of you that have painted with traditional oils know we can't do that. If you were painting in traditional oils, you'd have to have a different brush for every of the main color groups because you just can't clean the oil out of the brush that easy. Now when I started using these paints over 20 years ago, literally on the first day that they hit the market, there was no instruction on how to use these. Uh, so what ended up happening is I experimented over a number of years trying a variety of different ways to kind of make these paints work. And what ended up happening is I developed my own unique process to create my work. The fact that I have a unique process has led to my work having a unique look to it. So if you're familiar with my work, with the sun coming through the trees, all of them are painted in exactly the same way. Now I've put together the rest of this video to actually show you exactly how I create my paintings, the entire process from toning the canvas right up until the signature. So if you've always wanted to try these oils, or if you've left traditional oils because of the fumes that you'd like to come back, I really encourage you to watch the rest of this video. And if you click on the link that's provided, you'll be able to download a PDF that gives you my full materials lists, including the brushes, the paints, the mediums, everything that I use to create my work, as well as a set of detailed instructions of my process right from the start right till the finish. So here's how I create my paintings. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tone the canvas red. Now I'm squeezing the quinacridone crimson on here. I just do a few squiggles and I'm pretty used to this by now. I'm pretty good at judging how much paint um, I need. Now the reason that I paint on a red canvas, that's probably one of the questions I get asked the most. So there's two reasons for that. One is that because I paint the effect of the sun um, and backlit subject matter with the sun behind it, there's something that happens in nature called diffraction, um, which up close to the sun, it means that the sun or a bright light source almost eats right through the things that are in front of it. But what it also does is it creates like a warm halo around those objects that are backlit. Well, the way that I paint, because I paint the foliage first, and then paint the negative shapes into the foliage, that where, I, where there's a gap between those strokes, that leaves a little red halo on the outside edges of all the branches and all the foliage, which kind of exactly mimics what happens in nature. Um, and so anytime you can 
you can find a technique that's quicker and faster and actually does a really good job of mimicking what you want, and that's something to kind of keep in your toolbox. But now, I'm going to try to get into my regular painting position here, and we're going to start painting the birch trees. So I'm using this thick, stiff bristle brush um, that's got some paint dried in it. You'll see that it allows me to draw almost like I'm using a wide nib pen, and I really like um, that about these stiff brushes. So if you don't have any old brushes that are kind of with the paint dry them and just do the best you can. And I don't want them all to be straight trees either, so we're going to have some of these curved, curvy shaped trees. So that's this pretty much blocked in. Um, other than I just need this to dry a little bit. Actually, this area here is already pretty dry, so I can actually go ahead and do it right now. The one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the sun. Um, and I do that initially in gesso. Okay, so that's a pretty good circle. I will wait until this dries. And I'll come over it with another layer just to get that white very bright. So I'm using uh, Windsor Newton Artisan um, water soluble paint products. Now we also have the Windsor Newton Artisan water soluble linseed oil. And so this is something that you can use this to thin the paint, but what we're going to do is we're going to put a thin coating of this on the canvas before we start applying the paint, and that's going to make the paint slide on really nicely. We're also going to need a palette knife to mix your colors. Um, and I prefer using a small one. The smaller the knife, the less color you end up wasting. And then I also have a variety of different size brushes here. But I typically, I usually use mostly hog bristle brushes, both in flats and brights. Um, and then I have a liner brush or a rigger brush that will be really good for putting the highlights on the birch trees. I have another little round brush, doesn't really matter what kind it is, that's going to get in to do some details. Um, and then I have this big brush here, this is just a big house painting brush. Um, we're going to use that to spread the linseed oil on our canvas. Then when we go to mix our paint, we need a palette, and what I like using is, this is a Canson palette paper. Uh, it comes in a pad, um, and what I do is you rip it off. I just have it on a sheet of plastic core, and it just tapes down on here, and this is where we're going to mix all of our paints. Um, the key to using this is just make sure the shiny side is up. Uh, the other side is very absorbent, and will suck all the uh, oils out of your paints. We're also going to need a jug. Two jugs for water, one with a little bit of uh, hot water and one with a little bit of hot soapy water and that's what we're going to use to clean our brushes. And then you're also going to need the photo here, our reference, and you should find that as a JPEG on your download. And we'll also provide a PDF of all of the equipment and all of the brushes, etc. that I'm using. I'm going to use some of this uh, impasto medium. And what this does, this is like a mix of marble dust and oil medium, and it just really thickens up the paint. It's like almost like adding body filler to your paint. And the reason you'd want to do this is twofold. One is that it speeds up the drying time, um, which I like. Um, but also when you're putting on thick strokes of paint, it makes the paint much more stable. So now I'm going to mix the colors that are, of my leaves first. So I'm going to take some of that magenta and we'll mix it with the cadmium red light and I'll also mix it with the alizarin crimson. We'll also mix some of these yellows together. Now these are really pure, intense colors, which actually is nice, but I also know I have some dulled down versions of color. So what I want to do there, I'll take the complement of yellow and we'll add a little of that cadmium yellow deep. And that now gives us just a little bit more brown, sort of neutral tone of those yellows and those warm golds. Now this is a, this is a phthalo green, which is a very kind of pure, intense green. 
And one of the things that I found is a really great way to mix nice greens is to actually mix red in with your greens. Just kind of knocks them down and neutralizes them a little bit. And then we'll add a little bit of white in here too. More of the yellow. So there's that nice kind of limey green, but it can be kind of too pure and too intense. But you can see when we mix it with a little bit of orange and a little bit of red, we get that nice transition from kind of a gold, golden brown to an olive color, and then into the greens. And our greens are just a little more colorful. So one of the one of the keys to mixing really colorful greens is mixing oranges and reds in with them as well. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it really gives you a lot of very colorful greens. And these are more like the greens that you actually see in nature. I'm going to coat this with the water soluble oil. So if I can get the child proof cap off. There we go. Okay, so the easiest way to do this is to pour a little bit of it on and then spread it with the brush. And ideally here, what we want is we want a thin film of the oil to cover the canvas. We want just a light sheen, but we don't want enough of the oil on there that it actually runs. So when we stand the painting up, the easy way to, to take the test is once you've spread the oil all across the canvas, you stand it up on your easel, and if it's thick enough anywhere where you can actually see it running or dripping down the side, then you need to wipe a little bit off. And the easiest way to do that is just with a piece of, uh, you need to do it with like a piece of cotton cloth from an old rag, or even a paper towel. I'd recommend using a shop towel just because the regular paper towels tend to break down and you'll get, you can get little pills of paper towel on your canvas. So I'm gonna start with this big brush and I'm gonna do these foreground maple leaves. And so I'm gonna go in to the red on my palette and I'm gonna mix a bunch of the reds together. And I'm gonna do these strokes. Now I figured this out a long time ago, kind of a way to kind of suggest maple leaves is there's kind of like four strokes. There's two strokes at the back of the leaf, two strokes this way, and one stroke that way. And that basically suggests a maple leaf, but we don't wanna get into where it feels like we're rendering maple leaves because then it'll just look too contrived. Okay, I haven't actually cleaned my brush yet, uh, but I'm gonna do that now. So I have two tubs of water over here. Um, and this first one here has a little bit of dish soap and some warm water, just about two inches of water. And this one here is just pure warm water. And you can see by going in there and rinsing the brush off, I can get back to totally clean brush and now I can switch up the colors. And I'm gonna look at some of these, again, these little areas of foliage that I did on the block in. And I'm just gonna put some strokes of color in here. And so I'm starting with this bluish green. And you can see I'm not like sitting down here and rendering um, little bits of foliage. I'm painting this really quickly, but I often find it, it really suggests more that really organic, random shape of foliage if you paint it quickly, as opposed to going in there and very carefully trying to render it. People always ask me too, they think I use some fluorescent colors or iridescent colors. It's just pure kind of cadmium. So I've mixed a little bit of white, in with the magenta, because that magenta is a transparent color, so it's very dark right out of the tube. But when I mix a little bit of white with it. So that's kind of getting like the light on the side of the tree. But what really sells this whole idea of the light of the sun is as we move away from the sun, then things start to get cooler. So now I'm putting some magenta, which is that cool red, 
and that's gonna go from magenta to purple. Now if you put a little too much paint on there like I did there, the solution is just wipe the excess out of your brush and come back with an almost dry brush now to just blend that out. What I'm gonna do is everywhere where I see the red of the canvas, that is going to be sky. And what I want is for there to be a gradation from the, the darker bluish and purple colors on the outside and getting to the warmer magentas and greens as we get closer to the sun. So what I'm doing here is I'm painting these kind of like bands of color that are curving in towards the sun and these deeper bluer bands are going to be wider at the edge and get narrower as they come in towards the sun. Okay, I think we just put a little more of the blue here. And then you can see I've saved a fair bit of the red in here of the background. That's where I'm going to come in now with that light magenta mix. If you are having trouble getting, here's something I want to show you. If you are having trouble getting the paint where you want because you can't, you don't have enough control with the brush out like this, you can use what's called a mall stick. And I'll just use this brush to demonstrate. So I'm going to put the brush against the corner of the canvas. I can rest my hand on that and come in and do very, very tight, detailed drawing type strokes. Now I'm going to go to a lighter, warmer mix. One of the things um, that is really effective in the painting is having things kind of go be in front of and behind other things, creating that kind of illusion of depth. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come into this birch and I want that very front edge of the birch right near the sun is going to be the only other place in the painting where we have pure titanium white. Whenever I make a stroke and it's like, oh, I got to fix it. I know I'm getting in that stage where uh, I could be maybe making it look not as good as it did a couple minutes ago. Okay, I would say at this stage, I'm going to call this painting finished. Um, there's only one more thing to do, and that's to sign it. And that can be really, really tricky on an oil painting, especially if you're signing it when it's wet. Now, what I like to do in a painting too is leave an area where there's just a little, not much going on and it could use something. And so if you look at this little area down here, um, even though there's a lot of color there, it's all pretty much in the dark to mid tones. And if I put a white signature in there, that's just gonna kind of give it what it needs, but the, the signature will still show up. So how do we sign a wet oil paint? Very carefully, first of all. So I'm gonna show you my high tech way of doing it. And I always do it the same way. And that is on the floor. So I'm put the painting down on the floor. I'm going to bring my palette down here with me too. And this is a brush case. Um, and it's really important if you're doing a painting, if you're working on a painting like this that has that gallery rack edge, um, you need to have your wrist supported above the painting so you can sign it. Um, and I just have a little round brush. I'm going to get a little bit of the white paint in there. And I can't sign my name all in one go. So I'll do a T. And it's also going to pick up and blend with the paint that's underneath, but I like that effect. Okay, just that little bit. And then back into more white paint. So there's the Tim. There's the P, and believe it or not, this is one of the most uh, trickiest parts of the whole painting process, because if I screw this up, I have to repaint that whole area. And the ER. A little flourish there. And so there's my signature. Here is the finished piece. Well, I hope you found that helpful, and maybe I've convinced you that these paints are worth a try. Now, if you are interested, don't forget to click on the link. You'll get a free PDF file that has my full materials list 
as well as detailed instructions on how to use these paints and my process from start to finish. If you want to learn even more about these paints, I have a full three and a half hour video that documents every stroke during that painting. I also provide a running commentary during the painting, not only what I'm doing, but why I'm doing it to celebrate the launch of my new online learning platform, the Tim Packer Art Academy. We're making this video available at an incredible discount. So if you click on the link to get the PDF, you'll also receive an offer to get this video at 50% off. Now the video is regularly $79. You'll be able to get it for $39. This is a lifetime purchase. You'll be able to download the video or live stream the video as many times as you'd like. So if you're keen to try these paints, click on that link and then keep an eye on your inbox. You'll be getting the PDF and you'll also get the opportunity to get the video for 50% off. I hope you found this video helpful. I'm Tim Packer and I thank you for your time.